Alright, what's going on guys? So the Berserk Memorial Edition is officially out. Well, Episode 1 is officially out. They're gonna come in installments on a weekly basis, so we'll get about 25 minutes here and there of, you know, the first three movies split up into episodes. Now, according to the announcement, we will be receiving some new material. However, it hasn't been specified how much new material we'll be getting, when it will be occurring, what it's gonna include, if it's just gonna be a couple extra scenes here and there, or if they're gonna expand upon things so it's hard to say at this moment but given the recent news that there's going to be this big announcement in December I believe it's going to be December 11th according to this time clock right here you know there's always that possibility that you know maybe after the movies are done there's going to be an announcement that they're going to continue the series possibly maybe they're going to do the Black Swordsman arc then go into conviction uh, possibly lost children so who knows I mean that's very optimistic but you know, let's not get our hopes up. Just like the new beginning a couple years ago, it might just be a berserk exhibition again, so you never know. Now, this first installment was relatively the same as the first 25 minutes of the first movie. All the scenes were the same. I watched both side by side just to see if there were any differences. I tried to see if the animation was a little bit touched up, maybe a little more vibrant, maybe a little more gritty. I tried to look for any differences whatsoever. And and after 25 minutes, I came to the conclusion that there was nothing different. We had the battle with Bazuzo, then we had the fight with Guts and the Band of the Hawk. Griffith took him down. Guts had the little dream sequence where he thought of Gambino, Donovan, and how he left the mercenary band that took care of him when he was younger. And then, you know, we had the scene with Casca where he woke up. He then had his duel with Griffith, and then Griffith claimed him as his own. Nothing was new, nothing was added, nothing was subtracted, and as far as I can tell, nothing in the animation department was changed. However, there was one big change in this episode that I feel improved upon it greatly, and that was the subtitles. Now, you might be thinking to yourself, well, this might be relatively trivial. I mean, how much could they have changed? Well, watching it side by side and quickly reading each side of the screen, there were some pretty noticeable and big changes. Now, in terms of the context of the situations themselves, the outcomes didn't change. It's not like they said something so drastically different that you would interpret that situation differently. However, the way things were said were more elegant in the Memorial Edition and they felt like they were closer to Kentaro Mira's writing as opposed to the original movie. Now, from what I could glean by just quickly reading back and forth, the original movie was a bit rougher with its translations. The dialogue almost felt like an action movie. It felt a little more punchy, a little more edgy, if you will. Whereas this time around with the Memorial Edition, things felt a little more elegant. They felt a little more refined, uh, Mira-esque, if you will. And in fact, I picked out three examples to show you exactly what I mean. Now, the first one we got here is Guts telling Griffith off. Now, in the original version, he says, make me your soldier or your playboy, it doesn't matter. And in the Memorial Edition, he says, then make me your soldier, your butt buddy, whatever. Now, the reason I don't like the original version, the 2012 version, is because the word playboy doesn't make sense within the context of medieval Europe. That's a term that was invented in the 20th century. I mean, there was no such thing as a playboy prior to that. So why would Guts use that term? Like, we know what it means by our standards, by what's gone on in the 20th and 21st century, but in the 14th, 15th, 16th century, that term had no meaning. So it makes no sense in that situation. Okay, so in the next situation we have is Griffith has Guts pinned down on the ground and he's ready to dislocate his shoulder. Now, in the original version, he says, or would you like me to dislocate your shoulder in the form of a question? But in the new version, he says, but this is the end now. Either admit you lost or get ready for a dislocated shoulder. Now, the reason I like the new version is because it's not a question. He's directly telling him what he's gonna do. He's being direct, he's being assertive, and he's being confident. 
The fact that he's asking a question in the 2012 version kind of makes it seem a little wishy-washy to me. It kind of loses a little bit of its power, and it doesn't seem like he's as confident in the newer version. So again, he's saying the same thing, but the way in which he's saying it makes more sense in the newer version. And then the final scene that we have here is after Griffith wins the battle, he grabs Guts, and in the original version, he says, you're mine now. Whereas in the newer version, he says, and now you belong to me. Now, this one's actually pretty obvious because if you go to the manga, verbatim, Griffith says, now you belong to me. So the your mind now isn't consistent with what Mira wrote, and it just doesn't sound as elegant. It doesn't have that same punch, like your mind now, like the you belong to me, like almost has that sense of like Griffith has ownership over him. Something about you belong to me just has a lot more power and weight to it. I know these might seem like trivial differences, but I think the new subs are quite a bit different and quite a bit better than the original version. So I'm actually very pleased about that. Um, so hopefully in the next episode, guys, we'll get some new scenes. If we don't, I'll still make a video and tell you what changed. I'm sure the subs will be different for that episode as well. So tell me what you guys think of the episodes and I'll catch you on the flip side. Alright, what's going on guys? It's the Berserk Memorial Edition Episode 2. Let's talk about it. Now before we actually get into the episode itself, because as it was in Episode 1, there's no new content again, I want to talk about something uh, that's actually kind of interesting and kind of bad. Uh, actually, it's really bad. The first four minutes of the episode starts off with the song Forces, and we get various clips of all three movies spliced together. So, yes, that's right. We see moments of the eclipse, of Griffith wearing the armor on his head, and his body absolutely desecrated after his year of torture. We see the Skull Knight. We see so much pivotal information in this first four minutes that it kind of begs the question, what the hell were they thinking? Why would they reveal all this? For fans of Berserk who have read the manga, seen the movies, seen the anime, this is no surprise. I mean, we we know all this information. None of this is shocking. However, if this is your first experience with Berserk, why are they doing this? I understand you want to tease some things here and there, but they're teasing everything. And not just teasing it, but giving away pivotal information to the point that it's almost a little bit infuriating. I mean, if I was a new fan coming into the series, I'd be like, what the hell, man? I mean, at first you might not be saying that, but after getting through all these episodes, you're going to be like, so back in episode two, why did you show me all that information? Why did you blow all that for me? It, it just makes no sense whatsoever. It's, it's a complete waste of four minutes. Like, it doesn't even need to be there. It's obvious they're just stretching out time so that they can call this a quote-unquote episode. They couldn't have animated four minutes of extra information? They couldn't have added a couple scenes here and there? Like, that's how you're going to spend your time? Just showing us scenes throughout the movie that are going to happen at a later point? Oh my god, I, I don't even know how to express it at this point. And then the next minute and 48 seconds is dedicated to like kind of like an anime opening. So the episode doesn't even start until 5 minutes and 48 seconds into the into the video. I, I get it if you want to have an opening for the episode. I mean, when you watch a series, you see an opening every episode. But why are you guys stretching it out like this? It, it just makes no sense whatsoever. Now, as for the opening itself, they play the song Aria, and there's a couple of still shots in there that are rather interesting. They show Puck, Farnese, Serpico, and Isidro. So, really cool shots of all of them. I know Farnese and Serpico show up in, I believe it's the second movie. They show up for like a brief cameo. They don't talk or anything like that. They're on the screen for maybe like two seconds. But what's really interesting is we get still shots of Shirka and the Berserker armor. Now obviously Shirka and the Berserker armor don't show up in this movie. Now, is that a little teaser saying that, hey, after these movies, we're going to start going into the Black Swordsman, Conviction, and Falcon of the Millennium Empire arcs? That would be cool. Although, they could just be throwing it in there like, hey, you know how much you like Shirka? You know how much you like the Berserker armor? Well, there it is. You saw it! 
We're not gonna animate it, but it was there, so who knows guys, maybe they're just trying to like get up our hopes and then they're gonna dash it in the future, maybe it's a sign of things to come, who knows, but as for the episode itself, like I said at the beginning, there's no new scenes, the animation as far as I can tell did not look improved whatsoever. I mean, maybe they touched up the colors a little bit here and there. I don't know. I'll let you guys be the judge of that. I mean, it's not like I hated the episode. I'm just saying that I, I didn't see any improvements. And again, I watched these episodes side by side. So I watched the second episode of the Memorial Edition side by side with the first movie uh, that came out in 2012. And like I said, I was looking back and forth constantly. I was pausing the videos, trying to see if anything looked different, if it looked a little sharper, if they improved upon things, if they adjusted the colors a little bit, I couldn't find anything. So as for the meat of the episode, Guts and the Band of the Hawk take down the Black Ram Iron Lance Heavy Cavalry. Now it is interesting to note that, um, like I said in the first episode, they did change the dialogue for a couple of scenes here and there. Now in the manga, that's the correct name for this group, the Black Ram Iron Lance Heavy Cavalry. Now in the original 2012 movie, they actually called them the Black Sheep and Iron Spears Heavy Cavalry. I don't know why they would change it from Ram to Sheep. I mean, Ram just sounds so much more imposing and fearsome like why would they do that um so i'm glad that they changed that in the new episodes now after the battle casca excoriates guts for his reckless behavior griffith breaks them up and reminds guts it's been three years since their initial duel and he remarks that the duel was a time that was very fun and he enjoyed it quite a lot now we see a scene in which the various nobles are talking about the hawks and their accomplishments. Guts eventually enters a castle and encounters Nosferatu Zod. After struggling with him a little bit, Griffith decides to come in and give him some help. Zod, being a fearsome monster as he is, knocks Griffith over and as he walks up to him, he notices the crimson baylet around his neck and remarks that it's the egg of the king. And it's interesting because in the original 2012 version, he calls it the Egg of the Supreme Ruler. So, a little bit of a difference there. Um, I do prefer, obviously, the newer edition, Egg of the King. I mean, that's how Kentaro Miro wrote it in the manga. So, it's good that they're staying faithful to the manga in that regard. And then, Zod gives the prophecy to Guts, and then eventually flies off. So again, I didn't see any differences. I watched it side by side. I didn't see one thing that was different from the original version. The animation looked identical to me. I mean, maybe you guys noticed something. I I, I really couldn't tell. And, and, and if it was there, it was very minute. Again, enjoyed the episode. Had a fun time with it. I just don't know why they would spend four minutes blowing the remainder of the series. Like, why would you do that? And um, yeah, I just wish there was some new scenes here and there. I mean, that's... That would that would be great um if you're gonna make this memorial edition like go all out you know add some scenes touch things up here and there all right what's going on guys it's gonna be episode three of berserk the memorial edition let's get right into it now if you remember from episode two we ended off with the fight with zod now we transition over to midland where guts is training with his sword now if you remember the manga we don't go directly to this moment we actually have a moment in which griffith is recuperating and guts tries to see him. Unfortunately, Casca gets very enraged by this. She doesn't like the fact that he's not following the rules and says that Griffith needs time to recuperate. Of course, Guts doesn't really care about any of this, so Casca decides to punch him in the face. And while it's not a big moment in the manga, I still feel like it's very important and it would have been a nice scene to sort of add to the memorial edition. It kind of builds on the whole idea that Casca doesn't like Guts and that they got this very contentious relationship with each other. So it would have been a nice little moment to add into the anime, but you know, as you guys can tell from the first three episodes, there's no new moments, no new animation, and... Yeah, I mean, the only thing that's changed is the subtitles, which I will admit, it is better in the Memorial Edition, but, you know, they could have done so much more with it. Now, Griffith comes in to talk to Guts about demons and gods and how they might be the same thing. The king then arrives, he introduces Charlotte, and as Charlotte is leaving, she trips and Griffith catches her. Now, Julius thinks that Griffith is just trying to cop a feel or something, so he slaps Griffith across the face. 
Now afterwards, the Band of the Hawk serves as the King's Guard for the Autumn's Hunt. Now, what's kind of interesting about this is that there is one difference between the Memorial Edition and the movie. They actually cut a scene in which Charlotte was talking to another nobleman. It lasted for like 10 seconds. It was inconsequential. It didn't really add to the story whatsoever. But uh, I just kind of found it interesting that they cut that from the Memorial Edition. Um, so, you know... 10 seconds taken out of the Memorial Edition. Back on track, Griffith is lured away into a trap where he is shot with an arrow that has poison on it. After finding out that he was set up by Julius, Griffith devises a plan for Guts to assassinate the man that is second in line for the throne. And after killing Julius, Guts accidentally kills Adon, his son. Now in the Memorial Edition, Guts jumps into some water to escape, and it just transitions back to the bar where the Band of the Hawk is. In the manga, Guts actually has a dream in this moment where he's battling Gambino with a sword. But just as they're having a battle, we see the shadow of Nosferatu Zod. Zod impales Guts as a child, but then we find out it's not necessarily Zod. It's Zod's body, but it's Guts' face. And again, I feel like this would have been a nice moment to add to the Memorial Edition. Not only does it show that Guts is becoming more barbaric with his actions, but it also provides a little bit of foreshadowing and symbolism. It might be symbolizing the fact that Guts is becoming more like Zod, a beast, or it might be foreshadowing the fact that maybe there's some sort of link between Guts and Zod that hasn't been revealed in the manga yet. So, a nice little moment that could have been added, but, you know, they decided not to. Anyway, moving forward, we go to the banquet in which Griffith and Charlotte are at. Now, another interesting deletion from the Memorial Edition. In the original movie, they showed a couple scenes from the banquet. You know, they showed the performers, the various aristocrats, the food that was being served. This was just completely completely deleted from the Memorial Edition. Again, it doesn't really add to the story, um, you know, just, I guess they were trying to save some time, I suppose. Now, as Guts and Casca arrive at the banquet, they see Griffith on top of the stairs, and he talks about what it means to be a true friend and having a dream, and it's a nice scene for the Memorial Edition in the movie. However, I feel like it was better portrayed in the 1997 anime. It more resembles the manga in that regard, and I feel like they really captured that moment and made it feel so grand and important and pivotal to the story. It's very pivotal, and I like the music that's played in the Memorial Edition. I I just feel like it was done a little better in the 1997 anime. Alright, what's going on guys? Episode 4 of the Berserk Memorial Edition. Let's get right into it. Alright, so this episode starts off with the Band of the Hawk battling Adon and the Blue Whale Ultra Heavy Armored Fierce Assault Annihilation Night Corpse. <laughs> I always love saying that. It should be noted that this is chapter 14 in the manga and they skip the whole interaction with Griffith and Foss. And it also should be noted that the interaction with Julius and Foss in which they kind of conspire together to assassinate Griffith was skipped in the last episode as well. So Foss definitely having less of a role in the movies. Now back on track, Guts blocks Adon's fatal blow on Casca. Now of course the reason that Casca is having trouble fighting Adon is that she's going through her period right now and is having cramping and is very tired. Casca becomes lightheaded because of this and passes out. Guts tries to save her, but when he's distracted, he's shot by Adon with a crossbow, and the two of them end up falling off of the cliff. Now luckily they landed in the river, but to save Casca from drowning, Guts has to pull her out. He then has to strip her down because otherwise she would die from hypothermia, and he uses his own body heat to warm her up. We then see a flashback of when Casca was sold to a nobleman who attempted to rape her. Now this is really interesting because in the manga, she actually already woke up and was telling Guts this story. But in the movies, it's just a flashback or a, or a dream, if you will. Which I don't like as much because I like the fact that when Casca tells Guts this, Guts has the ability to commiserate with her. He has the ability to understand kind of her background and where she's coming from. But as a dream, Guts doesn't know any of this. He doesn't know anything about her history, so it, it's harder for him to really understand her. Now, as the nobleman is trying to rape Casca, Griffith comes in and rescues her. Well, he doesn't necessarily rescue her. He offers her a choice. He throws her down a sword, and she can either take up the sword and defend herself, or allow the nobleman to kill her. Given the fact that she doesn't want to die, she takes up the sword and ends up killing the nobleman, and henceforth becomes 
a member of the Band of the Hawk. Now, it should also be mentioned that we don't get any mention of the story where Griffith was with Lord Gennan, you know, trying to raise funds for the Band of the Hawk by sleeping with him. That that was entirely skipped altogether. Now, upon waking up, Casca's not too happy with her state of undress. Guts complains that she's acting irrationally because of the fact that she's a woman. Now, pissed off by this condescending remark, she states that she never wanted to be born a woman and tells Guts how she's jealous of him and, and the preferential treatment that Griffith has been showing him. Now, realizing that they're surrounded by the Tudor army, the two attempt to escape, but unfortunately are surrounded by Adon and his men. Now, realizing that Casca is compromised and she's just going to get in the way, Guts decides that he wants her to run off while he battles these hundred men. Now, it should also be noted as well that Samson, Adon's brother, does not make an appearance in this movie. Which is really unfortunate because... It's a short battle, but it's a really exciting one nonetheless, and, and it could have been integrated with like a 30 second clip, but again, they decided not to do that. Now, unfortunately for Casca, as she's running away, she's still having the cramps, so she ends up getting caught by the Tudor army, and they look to take advantage of the situation, they want to rape her, she starts having flashbacks of the time that she almost got raped by the nobleman, and decides that she does not want to be taken advantage of, so she fights back, buys enough time for the Band of the Hawk to come in and rescue her, and and, you know, she tells him, hey, we've got to still save Guts, he's out there, and that's the end of the episode. Now, one more important thing, in the manga, when the Band of the Hawk saves Casca, they're led by Judo. In the movie, they're led by Griffith. And I don't think this is a trivial difference, because why would Griffith, the leader of the Band of the Hawk, a man who is rising the ranks in the kingdom, be on a search and rescue mission? Why would he be leading the charge? Like, that doesn't make any sense whatsoever. Like, a search and rescue mission should be led by someone of a lower rank. It shouldn't be by the leader of the army. So Griffith leading the charge here is kind of weird, to be honest with you, but because the movies are cutting out so much material, they probably figured that, hey, we need to integrate Griffith a little more. Let's just have him be in the search and rescue mission. So it is what it is. You know, there's a lot of things that I don't like about the movies. They skip a lot of information. They're changing things around a little bit. And, um, you know, the Memorial Edition is not really fixing any of that. So it, it's really disappointing pointing all around. But with that said, guys, episode five is going to have the new material that we've all been waiting for. Because after the battle with the hundred men, we're going to have the campfire of dreams. All right, what's going on, guys? Berserk episode five of the Memorial Edition. Let's get right into this. And you're probably noticing right off the bat, I'm pretty excited for this episode. That's because we're finally getting some new scenes here. Nine whole minutes of new scenes, actually. The campfire of dreams is in this episode. And uh, yeah, yeah, let's get right into it. Now we pick up where we left off in the last episode. Guts is fighting Adon's men while pondering Griffith's words about what it means to be a true friend. Now if you remember from the last episode, Casca is telling Griffith that Guts is all by himself and they need to go help him. So the Band of the Hawk eventually finds Guts and he's leaning up against a tree. Now he's not moving at first, they're not really sure if he's alive or dead, but it turns out he's still living, he's just extremely tired and extremely wounded at the moment. But, that being said, they're very happy that he's still alive, and they celebrate the fact that he's the 100 man slayer. Now, in the movie, we immediately go to the battle at Doldry Castle, but this is where we have our first divergence with the Memorial Edition. So instead of going to Doldry Castle, we go to the Campfire of Dreams. We see Casca sitting by a fire with her comrades, and one of them mentions how it's a shame that Griffith left off for the War Council and didn't spend more time with Casca since, you know, she could have used a little one-on-one -on -one time with him. Judo then intervenes and takes Casco away for a minute. He then tells her something surprising, that the nobles in the battle were again saving Guts and Casca. But because Griffith made it clear that Guts and Casca were essential components to the Band of the Hawk, they had no choice but to listen to him. And upon hearing this, Casca becomes quite touched, which is a really nice moment for her. It shows that Griffith really does care about her, at least for the moment, and her role and her importance to the Band of the Hawk is not being undervalued. Judo then tosses Casca some elf dust and talks about how he got it from a good-natured sort of fella. And we get this great visual of Puck, which is absolutely awesome because this is the first time that we see Puck in the Golden Age movies. Obviously, in the original movies from 10 years ago, he doesn't show up whatsoever. So, even though we don't see, like, his face or anything like that, it's definitely Puck. We can see the outline and everything like that. So, that's a cool, nice little nod to all the readers out there. Like, yeah, we're thinking of you 
guys, we're going to put Puck in the movie just for a little bit, just to kind of show you a little bit of love. So I definitely appreciate that, and that it's such an awesome moment. Upon getting the elf dust, Casca kind of finds it hard to believe that Judo actually got this from an elf. But he's like, well, you can believe me or not, but it is what it is. And, uh, you know, it's good for healing wounds and such. Now, Casca makes her way to Guts, and we have a couple gorgeous scenes of the sky and Guts and Casca here. Really nice animation. I know a lot of it's still shots, but it's still really nice to look at. It just kind of makes me a little bit, you know, down in the dumps. Like, I, I love these scenes and everything but I just wish there was more of them. Like, could we have got more of this in episodes one, two, three, and four? Like, could they have added a couple extra minutes here and there? And then by the end of the 10 or 11 episodes, like, we'd have, like, a good chunk of time that's, like, new material instead of this, like, one nine-minute clip and possibly that's it. So it's, it's both a blessing and a curse in a way. It's like, yes, we got some great material, but at the same time, it, it leaves you wanting some more. Now, Gut says the reason that he's not by the others is that he's feeling a little hot at the moment and he likes the cool air on his body. Casca then spreads some of the elf dust on Guts and the swordsman notices that the pain from his wounds are subsiding. Guts then states it doesn't matter how many men he fights because what Casca and Griffith are trying to achieve is much greater than that. He mentions how his second in command, Gaston, wants to open a clothing shop in Windham and each one of his men in the Band of the Hawk has a dream, a small fire if you will. And each one of those fires has been thrown into the giant inferno that is Griffith. Unfortunately for Guts though, he doesn't have a dream. He hasn't really found his fire yet. He hasn't found that passion. He just simply swings the sword because it basically means that he gets to live another day. And in a way, he simply came along to warm himself by the fire, but he's not going to be staying permanently. Now, upon hearing all of this, Casca realizes that Guts is thinking about leaving the Band of the Hawk. And this is the first time that we really find out that Casca has some feelings for Guts. Now, when I say feelings, I'm not alluding to, like, romantic feelings or anything like that. Just feelings of camaraderie and friendship. Like, before this moment, Casca basically hated Guts. You know, the time that they fought Zod, she was yelling at Guts, it's all your fault. The time that Guts tried to see Griffith when he was in the hospital, you know, she was pissed off at him and punched him in the face. Like, she's always had these moments where she's been very contentious with Guts. But this is one of the first times in which we see that Casca's really opening up to Guts, that she's really forming a bond with him, and in a roundabout way, sort of stepping away from Griffith. Because before Guts, her whole life was devoted to Griffith, but now that Guts has sort of become a part of her life, she's slowly drifting away from Griffith, and she's becoming more intertwined with Guts. It's happening very slowly, but it's definitely happening. And the reason why these scenes are so important to the story is that creating that little bond and seeing that development between Guts and Casca is so crucial because without it, the love scene that comes later almost doesn't make sense. It kind of comes from left field, if you will. It's kind of like, well, where'd that come from? Where'd these feelings dwell from? How did they form this bond? Why, why are they giving in to these passions right now? But now that you see this little scene here, you can kind of understand like, oh, okay, like, her and Guts are really bonding here. Like, they're having a nice conversation. Maybe more of a conversation than her and Griffith ever had. Like, everything with Griffith is about the army and business. But with Guts, you know, they're talking about dreams. And they're talking about what they're going to be doing with their life. Which is a very personal topic. So, yeah, I really appreciate these nine minutes. Um, Absolutely fantastic. The animation was on point. If I did have one critique... When Guts is leaving, um, he stands up from the rock and he's walking away from Casca. And the way he's walking is very slow and it almost looks mechanical. It, it, it doesn't even look like he's walking. It almost looks like he's drifting away. It just, it looks like they kind of cut corners with the animation there. And it was, it was really noticeable the first time I watched it. And then I went back and watched it again. And I was like, oh yeah, it's, it, it doesn't look good. So it would have been nice if they kind of worked out all the kinks. I mean, it's only nine minutes of extra animation you would think they would make it like top 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 notch but you know besides that everything else is very gorgeous in these scenes now we're back on track with the movie again we then go to doldry castle where Bascon and the holy purple rhino knights take down the midland army 
The king and his advisors discuss future plans with handling the army, and Griffith volunteers to take down Doldry all by himself, with only his 5,000 men from the Band of the Hawk. The king accepts Griffith's proposal, and they're off. Lord Genin of the Tudor army then instructs Bascon not to kill Griffith, but to capture him alive. Now, this doesn't really make sense in the movies, because we never saw the scene in which Griffith sold off his body to Lord Genin to financially support the Band of the Hawk. That was completely erased from the movies, so it's it's not really known why Genin wants Griffith. Now, I know the movies are more intended for manga readers, but still, if you're coming into this fresh, it seems a little different disingenuous like it, it just it doesn't really cohesively make sense within the story like it would have been nice if they added that extra context but you know it is what it is now the battle between the band of the hawk and the purple rhino knights is about to start but many of the soldiers of the band of the hawk are a little bit leery they're a little bit scared but guts tells them to have faith in griffith griffith then decides to lead the vanguard in a very surprising move to Bascon, and because of their swiftness they're able to punch a hole through the tutor army. Now, Bascon doesn't look too worried about it, and in response, he decides to activate his heavy cavalry and tells his archers to be at the ready. Alright, what's going on guys? Episode 6 of the Berserk Memorial Edition. Let's get right into it. Now, Bascon uses his archers to slow down Griffith's army. Now, because Genin is worried that Griffith might die, he decides to enter the battlefield. Griffith then orders his troops to withdraw, which confuses Bascon. Genin, not wanting to lose the opportunity to lose Griffith, orders the army to pursue him, and to whoever captures him can name the reward. Now, I thought this was kind of interesting because there's a slight variation in the name of Genin's army from the Memorial Edition to the movies. Now, in the Memorial Edition, it's called Serpent Scorpion Fierce Attack Knights. And in the movies, it's called Spider Scorpion Storm Attack Knights. So, a slight difference there. I actually prefer the Memorial Edition. Serpent Scorpion sounds a little more menacing, to be honest with you. But Spider Scorpion is fine as well. Now, Biscon agrees to Genin's demands, but tells one of his soldiers that he wants Griffith dead. There technically is a new scene here, although it's debatable. Now, right before they have the introductory song, they have a brief still shot of Biscon with some, like, added shading and whatnot, which is kind of cool because it kind of reminds me of the 1997 anime in a way. They did a lot of scenes like that where they would just kind of pan away from an image or pan to the side of an image, so that's kind of cool. Again, it doesn't really add any content or context to the situation, but I thought it was a nice little detail there. Interesting bit of information as well, this whole thing where Bascon tells one of his soldiers that he wants Griffith dead never actually happens in the manga. This is anime original content. Now the Band of the Hawk fights the Tudor army, and as we see, Charlotte is praying by the Statue of the Holy See. With the main forces gone, Casca and a small contingency invades the stronghold. Guts and Bascon start their battle, and Bascon's right-hand man aims to take Griffith's head while he's not paying attention. But Genin charges in and puts a stop to this by eliminating him. Now, this is anime original content as well, this never happened in the manga, and to be honest with you guys, I'm not a big fan of this scene. Genin's supposed to be this pudgy, useless ruler. He's not supposed to be this badass military officer, so I thought this was a bit unnecessary, to be honest with you. And then after he does this, he even suspects that it's Bascon's doing. Inside the castle walls, Casca is tricked by Adan, but eventually steals his sword and thrusts it into the back of his throat. And the reason she stole this sword is because her own sword was broken. In the manga, however, it's Guts' sword that breaks, not Casca's. Also, Adan used a crossbow to injure Casca in the manga, but that didn't happen in the anime. On the battlefield, Guts defeats Bascon by using a flag as a distraction so that he can cut off his head. Obviously, the big difference here is that Guts' sword doesn't break. And because of this, it doesn't necessitate Zod throwing him a new sword. Unfortunately for us, though, we don't get to see Zod in this scene. Genin then begs Griffith to spare his life, but the leader of the Band of the Hawk merely says that he was a pebble in his path. He then finishes him off. Now, in the movie, we go straight back to Windham, where a celebratory parade is held for the Band of the Hawk. In the manga, two important things happen before this event. First, we see Guts and Casca having a moment together. One in which Guts picks her up, since she's injured of course, and Casca blushes. This further accentuates their relationship and their burgeoning feelings for each other, which I think is very pivotal to their overall character arcs. So it's kind of a shame that the movies don't show this scene. Now the other scene that was deleted was the Queen conspiring with Foss and the other Midland nobles to eliminate Griffith. Now the parade finally occurs and there's two interesting differences. Now these differences are rather 
rather trivial. It's not like it really makes it or breaks it for the anime, but I'll just point them out nonetheless. My man Corcus does not dab in the anime. <laughs> Nor does he do the Hulk Hogan posing. And then secondly, in the anime, Casca actually accepts the flowers that are given to her. And she actually looks really sweet in this scene. However, I think that can be seen as a hindrance because Casca is supposed to be this warrior. This rough and tough person. We don't really see her sweeter side until much later. Now in the manga, she's actually quite embarrassed by the situation, which obviously I prefer over the anime. What's going on guys? This is going to be a review for episode 7 and 8 of the Berserk Memorial Edition. Now the reason that I'm doing both episodes at once is because I was sick last week and um, yeah, it just worked out a little better this way. Rather than doing an episode 4 days, 5 days late, I might as well just do it all at once and give you a little more content that way. So let's get right into it. Alright, so this episode starts off with the Band of the Hawk. They're going to the celebratory party in their honor. Now, really interesting bit of information. This was in the movies, by the way. Serpico, Farnese, and Azan are at the party. So, it's a nice little cameo. They obviously didn't show up in the story in the manga by this point. They didn't show up until after the Golden Age arc. So, kind of a cool little addition there. Now, Gut slips away and eventually sees Casca in a dress. And he's rather impressed. He's like, holy cow, she cleans up pretty well. He then recommends that she should should dance with Griffith, but she's worried that she'd step on his feet. Now, after a little bit of conversing, Guts proclaims that he can't stand looking up to Griffith any longer, and he's sort of hinting at the idea that he's going to leave the Band of the Hawk. The King and the Royal Family then come out and promote the Band of the Hawk to the White Phoenix Knights, with Griffith attaining the rank of General. Now, after a little bit of dancing, we have a divergence here from the Memorial Edition and the movies. But before we get into that, it should be noted that in the manga, during the party, the Queen and various nobles Nobleman poisoned Griffith with a drink. He fell down, but it turned out that he was okay. And because of this, he enacted vengeance by burning the queen alive. So, this little bit of information was completely skipped in the movies and the memorial edition. Now, in terms of the divergence, this is actually anime original content, so I thought we were done with the Campfire of Dreams, but guess what? We got another 10 minutes of anime original content. So if you're keeping track at home, 9 minutes in the Campfire of Dreams, 10 minutes in this episode, we're up to 19 minutes of extra content. So that's absolutely awesome. I'm excited for the future. This possibly means we'll be getting more anime original content. I still don't think we're going to see Wild. I, I, I just don't think it's going to happen. There's just so much that goes into his character. I mean, you would almost have to add at least 30 minutes of extra content to make that happen. And I just don't know if they would allow that given all the censorship. But a man can dream, can he not? So in the movie, Guts goes straight to leaving the Band of the Hawk, but in the Memorial Edition, we see Guts talking to Judo in the bar, and Judo, being the ever-observant one, discerns that Guts is leaving. Now, this whole 10 minutes is so pivotal to the story, because not so much from Guts' perspective, but you get to learn so much more about Judo in terms of his talents and skills. Now, it should be noted that when Guts was leaving the Band of the Hawk in the manga, it was Casca that saw him and then she directed him to the bar where Judo and Corcus were talking to him. In the movie we didn't have that moment with Casca and Corcus is not in the bar. Now Guts explains that he can't stand Griffith looking down at him and he wants to achieve something of his own. Judo determines that it's crazy for Guts to leave considering everything they've accomplished together. However, to dream as Griffith has involves a certain measure of craziness in its own right. Judo has also noticed that Guts and Casca have gotten closer to each other after to the time they fell off the cliff. Additionally, Judo mentions that even though Griffith has attained the rank of general, because of the end of the war, his prospects of advancing even further are dwindling. Therefore, his only way of moving up is to attain Charlotte's hand in marriage. Luckily for him, Julius and Adonis are both out of his way, and it's at this moment that Judo contemplates the idea that maybe Guts had a hand in their deaths. 
I should also mention that when Guts goes to the bar in the manga, it's mostly Corcus who's excoriating him in the bar. Then when he leaves with Judo, they have this conversation outside in the snow, but in the anime here, they're just having the conversation in the bar. Judo then asks Guts if he likes Casca, and though his honest feelings somewhat emerge, he reinforces the idea that his place is not here with the Band of the Hawk. We then get back up in sync with the movie once again. Uh, Guts is walking through the streets, he walks up the hill, takes one last look at the city, and then he encounters the band of the hawk by a tree. Now, Casca tries to persuade him to stay, but he just kind of walks right past her, and then he confronts Griffith, who is rather surprised that he's leaving. Alright, so now we're on episode 8 of the Memorial Edition. We have a slight summarization of the last episode, with Guts talking to Judo and eventually deciding to leave the Band of the Hawk. The Band of the Hawk meets him outside of Wyndham and attempts to convince him to not leave the Band of the Hawk. Corcus then reveals that he's always hated Guts and can't stand him. Guts then prepares to leave, but Griffith draws his sword. Casca attempts to resolve the situation by intervening, but Guts has no intentions of declining Griffith's declaration of battle. Pippin pulls her aside, and Judo reminds her what's taken by the sword must be reclaimed by the sword. Judo then wonders if Casca has noticed the change that has happened within herself. Guts and Griffith ready their swords, and when a clump of snow falls onto the ground, Griffith lunges towards Guts. But, unlike their first battle, Guts manages his temper and defeats Griffith by cutting his sword in half. Realizing that he lost, Griffith collapses to the ground as the band of the hawk is shocked by what they just saw. Guts then finishes the battle by saying, see ya, and then leaves. Casca calls out for him, but he doesn't even turn around. Which, I always feel really bad for Casca. I mean, she just wanted some acknowledgement. I mean, the fact that he just walks away and doesn't even say a word is kind of a little disheartening, I'm not gonna lie. But, you know, it is within Guts' personality to do something like that, so, you know, I'm not too upset. I should mention that after the battle with Griffith, Guts goes into the woods, and that's when he has the confrontation with Skull Knight. That doesn't happen in the Memorial Edition or the movie. Skull Knight does show up, but it's at a later point. It happens at a point that sorta doesn't make sense. They tried to make it look like it was normal, but it was a little bit jarring of how they introduced him into the story. It kind of didn't blend too well. But, you know, we'll talk about that when we get there. Charlotte is then seen pining for Griffith, but one of the maids reminds her that it's impossible to see him. And then as the maid and Anna leave the bedroom, we see Griffith standing on the window from the outside. Charlotte lets him in, and the soaked Griffith starts to kiss the princess. The two make their way to the bed as Griffith makes love to the princess. And while this is going on, Griffith thinks about how Guts left the band of the hawk. Now, I mean, banging a girl is definitely straight and all, but thinking of a guy while you're banging a girl, uh, that's kind of a gray area, I'm not gonna lie. <laughs> <laughs> uh, one of the maids sees the two as we see the bailiff swinging back and forth in front of the fire. So, very ominous and a little bit of foreshadowing there. And then after the lustful event, we see Charlotte asleep when Griffith is on the side of the bed and he's got tears in his eyes. The next morning, Griffith is captured by the Midland Army. And while he's getting tortured, the Band of the Hawk is sent on an erroneous assignment in effort of luring them into a trap. And while they're disorganized at first from all the arrows that are coming in their direction, Casca eventually rallies the troops to charge forward and make their escape. Meanwhile, the King of Midland whips Griffith, while the White Hawk accuses him of wanting sex with his own daughter. Elsewhere, somewhere undetermined, we see Guts walking in an unknown place, where a caravan passes by, and inside we see Puck. Now, when we saw the new material in the Campfire of Dreams, I said that they added Puck to the Memorial Edition, and this was the only time that we're going to get to see him in the Golden Age arc. I totally forgot about this scene, so forgive me. It's probably been like, what, eight, nine years since I've seen the movie, so it's been it's been a while. I, I, I can't remember everything. And then the episode ends with the torturer ripping off Griffith's bailet and dropping it into the sewer system. Alright, so what's going on, guys? It's episode nine of the Berserk Memorial Edition. Let's get right into it. So we start off with Griffith's dream as he's running towards the kingdom. He's a little child and he's chasing the kingdom off in the distance, but then he wakes up and we get a close-up of his eye and, you know, a close-up of his body as well, and it's absolutely desecrated, skin is peeling off, it looks like he hasn't been fed for weeks, it looks like he's been brutalized and tortured, and he looks like just a complete mess right now. But then we see a crack in the wall, and we see these dark, oozing spirits come through. 
And they're like, we wish to have an audience with you, your majesty. And then Griffith sees some images, and we're not quite sure what's happening, but we see the various members of the Band of the Hawk, and it almost looks like some kind of nightmarish-like reality. And at the very end, we see a man with a dark cloak saying, we're waiting for you. And of course, for us manga readers, we know that this is void, and this is a premonition of the eclipse to come. Next up, we see an apostle walking through the forest, and some various villagers who are rather scared by this notion. Now, I do like how they were like, oh, we should contact the Holy See about this. Now, it says Holy See in the Memorial Edition, but in the actual movie, it says, let's contact the Vatican. Which, you know, doesn't make sense within the Berserk universe. Obviously, Miro was drawing a parallel between the Vatican and the Holy See, but, you know, to say Vatican... Vatican instead of Holy See just kind of doesn't make really any sense at all. We then see Griffith's Baylet floating in the water, very ominous, and then we're transported to the Band of the Hawk. You know, they're sleeping, they look really weary and tired, and even Casca looks a little bit tired as well. Now, Judo comes up to Casca and tells her that Rickard found out where Griffith is being kept. But before they could do anything about it, the camp is attacked by some mysterious people, and we find out that the attack is being led by none other than Salat. Now, Salat looks like he's got the advantage on Casca, he's got her down on the ground, he's threatening to kill her, but just in the nick of time, Guts returns and saves her life. Now, not easily deterred, Slat decides to take out his Arumi and decides to cut up Guts, but Guts creates a whirlwind that stops the attack and pushes Slat back. Now, Salat, realizing that he's undermanned right now, and he's got no chance against the hulking Guts, decides to run away with his tail between his legs. Now the very next day, Casca's taking Guts to a hill and she wants to talk to him. Now before this talk actually happens, Guts has a bit of a flashback here where he recalls a conversation that he had with the Band of the Hawk in which they told him that Griffith was captured one year ago. Incidentally enough, it was a day after Guts left the Band of the Hawk. Now, Casca tells Guts to defend himself, and she starts attacking. And while she's attacking him, she says that it's all his fault. The reason that Griffiths lost his way is because he was depending on Guts, and Guts left him high and dry. And Guts is like, no, this doesn't sound like Griffith. Griffith is a self-independent person. He doesn't need anyone else by his side. He has ambitions and dreams. But Casca reiterates the point that Griffith is no good without Guts. And with this stunning revelation, Guts doesn't defend himself from Casca's sword thrust, and it goes right into his abdomen, then grabs onto the sword as Casca pulls it right out. Now Casca, having to deal with all the trauma of the situation, just can't handle it, and starts to walk to the edge of the cliff, and begins to pass out. Guts obviously wants to save her life, so he reaches down, he grabs her, and he pulls her back up. And it's funny, he's like, oh, that's it, you know, no more going by the edge of cliffs for you. <laughs> Which is funny because every time she goes by the edge of a cliff, she's always falling off of it. Now, after the whole incident, you know, they have a one-on-one -on -one moment and they both start to let their defenses down and then eventually Guts kisses Casca on the forehead and then they start to make out and uh, one thing leads to another and bammo, Guts scores! Now, there is a difference and uh, we get another six minutes of new animation here, guys. Uh, so if you're keeping track at home, we got 25 minutes of new animation to date. So through the first nine episodes, we essentially got one episode of new animation. So I'm actually quite pleased with this. This is actually fantastic news. And this goes into detail about what happens in the wounds chapter, particularly the part when Guts is having sex with Casca and he starts having the visions and nightmares of when Donovan raped him. And while I like this whole sequence, that one scene where, you know, Guts is a kid and he's, he's tied up and he's on the ground and then they show Donovan behind him. I don't know. Something about the way that they drew Donovan here kind of made him seem a little awkward, to be honest with you. I, I don't know. Something about this just doesn't look quite right to me, but it's very scary nonetheless, and that's kind of the point of the whole situation. I don't know. Maybe it's just Donovan's face or something, or I, I, I don't know. Just It just looks really weird to me. And then we get a very nice scene here of Guts choking a childlike version of himself, and then when he comes to, he realizes that he's actually choking Casca in real time. After snapping himself out of this, you know, he starts to panic, he's in a bit of a delirium right now, and he's like, you know, that vile pig Donovan, like, how could Gambino let him do that to me? 
And then he goes through a bevy of emotions and Casca not really understanding what's going on here because he's just kind of rambling about incoherent things, thinks that it was Gambino that was the one that abused him, but Guts is like, no, it wasn't Gambino. You know, Gambino was different. You know, he was, he was my dad, you know, he, he, he was there to protect me, but you know, he was drunk all the time and all he cared about was his dog. So, you know, Guts is venting a lot of his emotions here. And I, I love that they added these scenes because it really showcases how even though Guts has sort of moved on with his life, there's still these remnants of his past that he hasn't let go of yet. And because he's finally venting these frustrations to Casca, it's very therapeutic for him. It's a way of him sort of getting some of this stuff off of his chest and sort of reconciling all the atrocities that have happened in his life. Now eventually Guts is crying by the waterfall and then we have that very picturesque moment of when Casca comes from behind him and gives him a hug. And um, that moment in the manga is probably one of the best panels in the entire Berserk manga. Not so much in terms of like the detail, but just in terms of like what it means to both Guts and Casca as characters. You know, both of these characters are so proud and so strong and never let their defenses down. But in this moment here, with both of them not wearing any clothing, kind of showcases the fact that they're becoming vulnerable for each other for the better so that they can help each other out so that they don't have to bear these burdens alone anymore. This moment is so essential for Casca's development as well because you finally get to see her let go of that picturesque vision of Griffith that she had in her mind and start to give herself into guts start to believe more in herself and more in the possibilities of the future. And then Casca's like, you know, I've given you so many wounds over the years. It's time that you give me one of your wounds. And then she licks the blood off of his abdomen. And then again, we have a very picturesque scene of when they're both making out on the grass like this. Very reminiscent of this scene in the manga. And then after that, we sync up with the movie once more where Casca's asking Guts if he's going to leave the band of the Hawk again. And he's like, well, why don't you come with me? And of course, she looks a little bit indecisive right here. She's not really sure that's the best move for her at this point. I mean, she's devoted her whole life to Griffith. But yet, at this moment, the man that she loves is asking her to leave. And then we end the episode with the two making out once more. So I absolutely love the six minutes, guys. Another great episode. Uh, animation was really good. The scene with Donovan looked a little weird and some of the faces that Guts was making um, as he was like crying and lamenting the fact that Gambino sold him to Donovan. Some of those scenes looked a little bit awkward, but for the majority, it looked really nice. I love the content. It added a lot to the backstories of Guts and Casca and with episode 10 coming next guys we're gonna get to see the skull knight all right what's going on guys berserk memorial edition episode 10 let's get right into it all right so we pick up where we left off guts and Casca are with each other now Casca falls asleep and guts notices a sound that's coming from the woods he decides to put Casca down he starts to look around and can't determine where the sound is originating from but all of a sudden the clouds become overcast we see a mist and a mysterious man the skull knight comes through and gives a prophecy to guts now it's very mysterious and cryptic and Guts has no idea what he's talking about and before he's got any time to ask any questions the mysterious man the Skull Knight decides to leave. Now, like I said in a previous episode, this moment actually was rearranged. It's supposed to happen after the time that Guts left the Band of the Hawk and he was in the woods by himself. It's not supposed to happen after Guts and Casca have sex with each other, which is kind of weird because Guts is confronting the Skull Knight completely naked, which kind of makes you wonder what the hell the Skull Knight was doing all this time. <laughs> Just lurking in the woods by himself, watching Guts and Casca the whole time. Now after this occurs, Guts, Casca, Judo, and Pippin go to the Midland Castle. They sneak through uh, with the help of Charlotte and Anna to save Griffith. Now in the manga, before this happens, Guts tells Casca a story about how he was in the woods for a year and he was staying with a man, Godo, and his daughter, Erica. So unfortunately in the movies, they're not mentioned whatsoever. However, it should be noted that in the 1997 anime, there was a dedicated episode where Guts was shown with Erica and Goto in the woods. So kind of a little bit disappointing that the Memorial Edition didn't add any of this information. That would have been kind of nice. I mean, it could have literally been like a one, two minute clip, but again, kind of a bit of a failure there. Now inside the castle, Charlotte decides to tell the Band of the Hawk members about the story of Supreme King Geyseric. He was a king that lived a thousand years ago. He was very rough and brutal. However, some events occurred in which four or maybe possibly five angels came 
down and destroyed his entire kingdom. The Band of the Hawk then gets to the prison cell and they're very surprised to find out that Griffith is lying on the floor, his tendons are cut, his tongue is cut out, and he's just absolutely desecrated. Casca wants to take a look at him, but Guts is like, not right now, Casca. Uh, it's just too brutal to look at. And then as Griffith looks up at Guts, you know, he's feebly trying to choke his neck. You know, he's so pissed that the reason that he ended up in the torture chamber is because Guts left the band of the Hawk. Now, of course, Guts doesn't notice this. He just embraces Griffith and he starts crying, but Judo sees this. But what's really interesting is that Judo doesn't happen to mention this to Guts, Casca, or any of the other members of the band of the Hawk. Now, the prison guard mocks them and talks about the fact of how he cut out Griffith's tongue, so Guts decides to drive his sword right through him and even cuts off his tongue and begins to mock him. After killing him, the various members of the Midland army decide to descend upon them, but Guts goes berserk and starts to take them all out. They then leave the Tower of Rebirth and get some help from one of the citizens to escape via a carriage. Now, it should be noted that before this happened in the manga, the king instructed the Bakiraka to attack and assassinate the members of the Band of the Hawk. So, Guts and his crew had a very epic battle with the Bakiraka in the sewer system before they escaped. And then after the Bakiraka were defeated, the king got desperate and decided to use Wyal to track them down. Now, I never expected Wyal to make an appearance in the Memorial Edition. He's just too too brutal, and I imagine for censorship issues, they probably just couldn't animate him. However, I thought maybe they might add the Bakiraka. I mean, that's a fight that doesn't take too long. You know, that might be like a five minute addition to the episode, but again, they decided not to do that. Now, the Band of the Hawk is on the carriage, and they decide to ram their way through the exit. They notice that they're being chased, and there's even an ambush for them where arrows are descending upon them. But they're in luck, because Corcus and the other members of the Band of the Hawk are there to save their butts. Now, after they reach safety, they're thinking everything's back to normal again. Corcus is very happy, but very quickly, Casca finds out from Judo that all of Griffith's tendons are cut. He's got no tongue. He's never going to walk again, let alone hold a sword again. So his days of fighting in the military are completely over. We then have a moment in which Guts is in the carriage with Griffith, and Griffith wants his armor on, and Guts is like, ah, you know, that's so like you, Griffith. The Band of the Hawk then has a debriefing meeting where Casca lets them know about the situation and many of the members especially Corcus is in disbelief they can't believe their leader Griffith has been reduced so low that his physical abilities are such that he's never going to fight again let alone lead them in the battlefield now Guts is asking Judo what he's going to do and Judo's like ah oh, you know we'll probably just become thieves again and support ourselves that way and Guts is like well I'll come with you and he's like no 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 you already decided to leave your battle is not here and this time make sure to take Casca with you. And as Guts is trying to make a decision about what he should do, the various members of the Hawk Raiders come up to him and they're like, hey, before you leave this time, make sure to take you with us. And they're all begging and pleading with him and he's really not sure what to do. He's just contemplating at this moment. And that's the end of the episode, guys. So unfortunately, we got no new material this week. I was hoping that maybe they would add the part with Godo or maybe even the part with the Bakuraka. We didn't get that, unfortunately. All right, what's going on, guys? Episode 11 of the Berserk Memorial Edition. Let's get right into it. Now, before we actually start the episode itself, I just want to say, due to the Berserk announcement that came out earlier today, we now know that there's only going to be 13 episodes for the Memorial Edition. So I was speculating that there might be a 14th episode, they might continue on, they might add extra material, but it doesn't seem like there's going to be a significant amount of material coming our way in the future. So I would guess 95% of these last two episodes is just going to be, you know, stuff we already saw from the Golden Age films and that's about it. But I will say this, there was about 50 seconds of new material in episode 11, so that was pretty badass. So we'll get to that when we get to that, but let's get going. Now, Casca is changing Griffith's bandages, but when she starts to cry, Griffith gets on top of her. And even though she wants him to get off, she soon realizes how frail he is and merely allows him to continue doing what he's doing. We then transition to the new material. Now we see Rickards in town and he goes to a shopkeeper. And the reason that he's there is twofold, to get some salve and to secure an escape route for the Band of the Hawk. 
Now, the shopkeeper says that he secured a route through Rickhart's mountains. He does offer a warning, however, that strange monsters are showing up around the border. Now, I will say that not only is this new material for the anime, this never showed up in the manga, so this is completely original. And I gotta say, it's actually a really nice addition. I, I really enjoyed this. This is really cool. It's kind of cool to see what Rickert was doing while the Band of the Hawk was getting caught up in the eclipse. So, I, I felt like this was a good addition. I liked it. It was only about 50 seconds. It didn't last long. But still, you know, I'll take what they'll give us. And then for the rest of the episode, we're back on track, like always. Uh, no other deviations besides this one. Casca is then seen in emotional distress. Guts goes in to check on her, and she says that she can't go with him because she can't leave Griffith's side, since he's so frail and all. Guts wants to stay too, but Casca reminds him that if he wants to be Griffith's equal, he's gotta go. Of course, when Griffith hears this, it rocks him to his very core. Griffith then has a vision of his childlike self running off to the kingdom. And while he's doing this, he's saying, we're not done playing yet. And in a desperate attempt to attain the kingdom, Griffith chases the childlike version of himself until the horse-drawn carriage hits a rock in the road and flings him off. He then goes flying through the air until he comes crashing down into the water. Realizing how pointless it all is, he starts laughing in a maniacal fashion. He then sees a sharp stick in the water, and realizing that life is all in vain at this point, he prepares to commit suicide. But, ultimately, he can't do it, leaving him to wallow in the water alone. We then notice that the moon is blocking the sun, causing a solar eclipse. And as this is occurring, Guts and the Band of the Hawk make their way to Griffith. And when Guts touches Griffith's shoulder, it activates the Baylet, transforming the entire environment around them into a hellish landscape. We then see a bunch of apostles calling for the four guardian angels. So anyway, they're calling for the four guardian angels, and then, to start things off, we got a gigantic naked woman rising up. Her name is Slan, and she spreads her wings in a glorious yet terrifying fashion. Ubik comes down next, terrifying everyone in sight, followed by the loud and annoying Conrad. And I gotta say, it's been a while since I watched these movies, so I forgot how loud and annoying Conrad was in this scene. Like, I, I, I didn't remember that part whatsoever, so that was kind of a cool refresher for me. And then to round things out, we've got the preeminent Archangel himself, the man with the exposed brain, Void. It is then explained that the Band of the Hawk will be sacrificed so that Griffith can transcend his humanity. And the person that will make this decision is Griffith himself. Now the Band of the Hawk is very scared and quizzical about the whole proceedings, but before they can react, Griffith is then taken up to the altar as Guts hangs onto his hand. Unfortunately, given Griffith's physical injuries, he drops Guts as he is set before the four members of the God Hand. Now, before we actually end this episode itself, if you'll notice in the picture right here in the movies, Void is on the middle finger and Slan is on the thumb. But in the manga, it's reversed. Void is on the thumb and Slan is on the middle finger. Which makes a lot more sense because the middle finger in America means F you. So you would think that would be the perfect finger for Slan. And given that the thumb is sort of the most important finger of them all, that would be the spot for Void. But for some reason in the movies, they have Void on the middle finger. I'm not sure why they did that. I mean, it really doesn't affect the ending whatsoever. But again, it's like, why go out of your way to change it? Why not just leave it the same? So, who knows? Alright, what's going on guys? Berserk, episode 12 of the Memorial Edition. Let's get right into it. But before we do that, if you guys got time, please subscribe to the Berserk Dude channel. And if you want to support the channel further, you can consider supporting me on Patreon as well. Otherwise, the best thing you can do is watch the videos and give me a like, guys. But yeah, let's get into episode 12. And before we actually start the episode itself, I just want to say, guys, that now that we're at the final two episodes, Episodes, it's a little bit sad for me. I've had a lot of fun going through these 13 episodes with you guys, breaking them down, talking about them, revisiting a movie I haven't seen in years, and, and you know, seeing the new additions to the Memorial Edition has been a lot of fun as well. So yeah, just want to thank you guys for, you know, going along with the experience with me and just having a great time. So as you guys remember, Griffith is sitting down and he's listening to the God Hand, and he's being given a choice. But before he's given that choice, he sees a vision of his younger self running toward the kingdom. But as he's running towards that kingdom, he soon realizes that he's running on top of a bunch of dead bodies. Dead bodies from the Band of the Hawk that died in his previous battles. And there's an old fortune teller who's telling him that he's the cause of all these dead bodies, and that if he wants to attain that kingdom, he has to stack the bodies higher. 
And he stares off in the distance and he sees that shining, gleaming kingdom that he's always wanted all his life. And then he's brought back to reality and he's like, what was that? An illusion of my mind? And Ubik is like, yes, you created this illusion. This is truly what you want in your heart. And the Band of the Hawk is watching on and they're very scared and fearful right now. And then Void brings out this burning symbol, the brand of sacrifice. And he gives Griffith a choice. Sacrifice all your comrades. Sacrifice the wings of the Band of the Hawk and you shall be given jet black wings in return. And Guts is watching on. And then Griffith has a moment in which he remembers all the times with Guts. Everything from their first sword battle to when he left the Band of the Hawk to all their battles and then he finally says the words I sacrifice as he stares down Guts. Now Guts goes to get Griffith but unfortunately for him the giant hand the hand of God closes down on Griffith blocking Guts's entry point and then Void lifts up his arms we see the brand of sacrifice gleaming in the sky and then it spreads out across the entire band of the hawk marking every single member in a very unique location for example we see a mark on Guts's neck for Casca it's on her heart for Corcus it's on his forehead Pippin it's on his arm and Judo it's on his hand now I actually made a video about this in which I explained why these specific brand of sacrifice marks are going on unique locations for each member of the band of the hawk so watch that video if you're interested in that. And with this, all the apostles in the area take their cue and start to wreak havoc on all the members of the Band of the Hawk. And you see Pippin fighting off the monsters and he tells Casca to go, she's gotta live. And she doesn't wanna go, she wants to fight with Pippin and the rest of the Band of the Hawk, but Judo grabs her on top of a horse and runs away. We then go outside of the Eclipse and we see Rickert staring at the giant tornado slash vortex that is just consuming the entire area. And Rickard is wondering what the heck is going on, and then he sees something off in the distance. And it's none other than Skull Knight and Zod fighting each other. And Zod's talking about the fact that Skull Knight's been opposing the God Hand for the last thousand years. And Skull Knight is questioning Zod. He's like, oh, so you're acting as the gatekeeper, huh? And Zod's like, ah, oh, hardly. I could care less about their little indulgent spree inside. And then we go back inside the Eclipse, and we see Corcus running away. And he's like, oh my god, this is a dream. I must be dreaming. I must be at my favorite bar right now but then he looks forward and he sees a beautiful naked lady and he's like "Ooh, maybe i'm not dreaming let's hope this isn't a dream and he rests his head inside her soft breast but unfortunately for him the woman transforms into a horrific monster and consumes him and it's a monster that's very similar to the hr geiger monsters especially the ones from alien something that inspired kentaro mira back in the day we then see guts saying you know it can't be true griffith would never said yes to this but you bick and slam and tell him otherwise. We then see a very strange monster confront Judo and Casca, and Judo decides to protect Casca with his body, but unfortunately for him, the monster impales him with his tentacles. Judo then throws a small dagger at the monster's eye, and Casca finishes it off. Now Casca decides to carry Judo as they walk away, and Judo is thinking about the fact that, you know, after all these years, I thought I was a lot cooler than I actually was, but even now, even in my last moments, I can't tell Casca my true feelings, and unfortunately, before he says anything further, he collapses to the ground and dies. And then Casca's still got her knife in hand, but unfortunately for her, she's quickly surrounded by the apostles. Elsewhere, we see Guts with a horn, and he's just impaling monsters left and right, trying to do the best he can in the circumstance. And then we transition over to Griffith as he's transforming into a demon himself. And I gotta say, I really love this part. The 2D animation here is really fantastic. You know, we see a lot of great scenes as Griffith is descending down into the abyss, and we see all the bailets coming in front of his body. And it's very Stanley Kubrick-esque. Uh, it's very similar to 2001 A Space Odyssey. You know, we see these lights, this psychedelic drug trip. It almost looks like brainwaves at a certain point. You know, we see the outer view of space, you know, Earth and the sun in the background. It's just a very gorgeous set of images. It reminds me a lot of 2001 A Space Odyssey and even Evangelion in a lot of ways as well. And then Guts eventually reaches a pool of blood and he realizes that it's all the members of the Band of the Hawk and no one seems to be alive at this moment. He then sees Pippin standing on top of a hill, but unfortunately when he gets to Pippin, he realizes that he's already dead. And the person that killed him was none other than the Count from the Black Swordsman arc, otherwise known as the Slug Baron. And just like Casca, Guts quickly realizes that he's being surrounded by all the apostles. And then as this is happening, we see Griffith's body as it's fully transformed into Femto, the new member of the God Hand. 
He then opens up his mouth, spreads his wings, and starts flying through the air and starts saying, na 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 Batman. <laughs> Anyone who's seen the Berserk outtakes knows what I'm talking about. And then Femto steps down onto the ground, and we got this great final shot here of Guts, Femto, and all the monsters in the background. It's just absolutely gorgeous and we know exactly what's going to happen next but for the memorial edition that's the end of the episode itself so yeah just what a gorgeous episode guys no new material but in regards to the movies themselves this is probably the best of the movies right here these scenes especially the ones with griffith going down into the abyss are just some of the best stuff that the movies have to offer all right so what's going on guys we're on episode 13 of berserk the memorial edition let's get right into it all right so this episode starts off with some scenes from the previous episode Episode. We see Femto being born once again, and then after that happens, he puts out his arm, and then the various monsters bring the naked Casca over the Femto. And then he starts groping her, grabbing her in very inappropriate places. Guts is watching the whole thing, and he's not too happy about it. And then as Femto starts to rape Casca, Guts gets very pissed off and tries to go to her. Unfortunately, Borkov, the apostle, bites down on his left arm. We then see Casca's perspective of the situation as she's looking up at Femto, and then we go back to Guts as he's just absolutely enraged right now. He then realizes that his arm is not going to come out of Borkov's mouth. He then tries to jab into Borkov's teeth, but it's not doing anything, and his sword actually chips off. So, he takes the blunt sword and tries to hack off his own arm. And then after doing so, he sprints his way to Femto and tries to cut him down, but unfortunately, some mysterious force prevents him from doing so. Nevertheless, Guts is able to push through the force and move his hand forward, which absolutely surprises Ubik and Slan. Femto then looks a little bit nervous by the situation, and we see that Slan is actually getting, what I would say, a little bit turned on. And as we know from the manga, Slan actually wants Guts to be part of the God Hand. Now after Guts is sent flying back, he's held down by the various monsters, and they start to pierce into his eye as he's watching Femto rape Casca right in front of him. And then as this traumatic event is going on, we see the eclipse in the sky, and then we see something breaking through. And we see the various apostles in Void looking upward, waiting to see what breaks through, and it's none other than the Skull Knight himself. And the first thing he does is that he races forward and he tries to cut Void down. Unfortunately for him, Void creates a spatial distortion in which the Skull Knight's sword comes through and comes back right at himself. He then goes around Void, slashes through some monsters, and goes right after Femto. Now Femto attempts to crush him by condensing space around him, but luckily for Skull Knight, he avoids this, grabs Casca and Guts, and runs out of the Eclipse. We're then outside of the Eclipse once more, as Rickard's still looking at the Whirlwind, and then we see Skull Knight coming forward. Now Skull Knight's got Guts and Casca on his horse, and he tells Rickard to take care of them. Now unfortunately for us as the movie watchers, they did skip a scene here. We're supposed to see Zod approach Skull Knight from the rear, and Zod is keen on rekindling their battle with each other, but Skull Knight is like, hey, we're gonna have to postpone our battle for a later date. So, unfortunately, that part of the manga did not make it into the movies, and it's quite a shame once again. We then transition over to the Puck, as the various God Hand members are saying that it's going to be a new age. An age of darkness, that is. We then transition to a dreamscape in which Guts sees the various members of the Band of the Hawk walking by without acknowledging him. He then wakes up from his dream and realizes that everyone is gone. And it turns out that he's in a cave by Godo's house. He then grabs onto Rickard and asks where Casca is and he's like over there. He then sees Casca in the waterfall and begins to approach her but unfortunately she freaks out. She's still traumatized from the eclipse. And it turns out that she's been in this childish, infantile state ever since the eclipse happened. And she even clenches onto Erica for safety and comfort. Unable to handle the situation, Guts runs out of the cave. He's breathing heavily. He's remembering all his times with the band of the Hawk. He's remembering Casca, Pippin, Corcus, Judo, and even Griffith himself. And he just doesn't know what to do, but as nighttime falls, he collapses to the ground, he's breathing heavily, and he starts to look up at the sky. And just then, he notices that something on his neck is bleeding, and it's the brand. And with this, we see various dark spirits lurking in the grass, and they start to attack him even. 
and one even gets into his body and starts to torment him. But luckily for Guts, Skull Knight comes in and tries to reassure him to fight the spirits. Guts then runs over to the Skull Knight, steals one of his swords, and starts to cut them down. And we got some really great shots of Guts here, you know, fighting the spirits down, clenching his teeth. I even love this one here where he just swings his sword down with both hands and you see the spirits splitting off. Now again in the manga, we had a situation in which the spirits went away from Guts and Skull Knights told Guts that they found another light, referring to Casca. With this, Guts went on the Skull Knight's horse, they rode over to Casca and saw the spirits surrounding her, and this is where Casca gave birth to the demon child. Unfortunately, we don't see that in the Memorial Edition. We then see Griffith descending into the darkness, descending to the idea of evil, and him shedding his last tear. And then we transition back over to Guts and the Skull Knights as the sun is rising. And Guts is looking at the sun, just staring off in the distance, and then we pan away, and that's the end of the movie, guys. Or should I say the end of the series? Now, afterwards, we see Guts loading up for battle. He's grabbing his various daggers, he's got his dragon slayer, he's got his cannon, and he's walking away from Goto's house, and he's officially the Black Swordsman. And that's officially the end of the series. Now, I should note, in the original movies, they did have something that said, this is only the beginning. Now, the reason that they probably put this in the movies is they were actually considering continuing the movies via the Lost Children's and the Conviction arcs. So they wanted to have a fourth, fifth, sixth, possibly seventh movie. And according to the founder of Studio 4C, Aiko Tanaka, they were planning on doing the Lost Children's chapters next. That was supposed to be the fourth movie. And the hope was to continue production of the movies to the very end of the manga. So it's unfortunate that things did not play out that way, and I'm hoping at some point in the future that they revive that dream, that they bring back the series. I know it wasn't perfect, I know the CGI wasn't the greatest at times, but I would still like to see the Lost Children's chapters. I would love to see the conviction arc. I mean, what we got in 2016 and 2017 didn't do Berserk justice. So something that brought the story to life again would be absolutely fantastic. And it's especially long overdue. I mean, as Berserk fans, we've been waiting for the Lost Children's chapters for years. I would love to see the Black Swordsman arc in its entirety, but we're left where we are, guys. But uh, yeah, that's the entirety of the Berserk Memorial Edition, all 13 episodes. Tell me what you guys saw of this series. Please like and subscribe. And if you like, I also got a Patreon as well. So if you want to support me further, please go there. But thanks for watching, guys, and I'll catch you on the flip side.